Hello, and welcome to episode number 102 of the LSR Podcast. My name is Matt Brown, joined each and every week by the brightest minds in all of the gaming industry with me. I have Dustin Galker. I have Adam Candy. They are free on the Twitter machine, and you should follow them because it costs you zero dollars and zero cents. At Adam Candy, that is two E's, no Y. At Dustin Galker, if you hate yourself, you can follow me at Matt Brown M2. We will talk about some big, big news with one of the market leaders within the sports betting and DFS realm, and uh, might be some shakeups for how that all plays out for some future maybe plans of the company. As well, we have another company spinning off to go ahead and go public with their, their iGaming product. We've got state updates. We've got some things going on in Illinois as well. But let's kick things off with that big story here. And, and, and Dustin, what we're looking at is a guy that, you know, took over for, for Nigel Eccles when Nigel left the company, the founder of FanDuel in Matt King. And we get some news, uh, you know, in the middle of the night last night that uh, he is going to be moving on. And I'd like to commend Adam for somehow being awake and writing a story <laughs> in the middle of the night because this uh, drops, the, the, uh, as we know, we cover a lot of European companies, and this dropped at like a little before midnight, I guess, something like that in uh, in uh, Pacific time here where we where we live. So kudos there because I, hey, I was... The uh, Knicks were in an important game on the West Coast last night. I know why Adam was up. Don't know, You don't have to tell me why Adam was up. I know why he was up. <laughs> I, I was so mad at myself for opening my email. Like I looked at my email <laughs> at 1130. I saw the message and I thought, well, not going to bed now. So... Yeah, I mean, well, yes. So to the news, yes, uh, the, the Sandals CEO, a, p- a part of Flutter, Matt King, uh, has stepped down. Uh, pretty sudden news. You wouldn't expect this to have uh, have leaked out either with, a, with such a major piece of news. But um, yeah, it came down that he's leaving. There is not an interim that we know of, and there's not. Uh, they're conducting a, C- a search to replace him here as, as a head of handle. But this is obviously pretty major news here. Uh, basically, the number one sports betting operator in the U.S. Uh, losing the person who has kind of taken it from uh, pre, pre-PASPA, pre-sports betting here in the U.S., uh, outside of Nevada, and, uh, and to the market leader by, by a pretty wide margin here in the U.S. So uh, reverberation still being felt here and exactly you know th- what's going to happen. This is a, a prime job. You're taking over uh, as, as the leader, and there will be pressure on whoever takes this job uh, to, to really obviously continue what Fandle's done and, and keep that market leading position. So uh, super interesting. And given all the history, uh, there's there's a lawsuit out there involving the former founder, Nigel Eccles and uh, and King and some of the execs on the Fandle team. That's that's been been sitting out there for a while. So lots, to, lots, to, lots to speculate about. Also, I mean, we talked about talked to Adam about this a little bit, too. But uh, there's just been this potential for an IPO spinoff of just the, of the U.S. business. And this put th- throws a little bit of doubt into that as well. So a uh, Lots of moving pieces, and we're still just trying to, to wrap our heads around what this means for FanDuel and U.S. sports betting. Flutter CEO Peter Jackson, while we were sorry to see him leave, he leaves the business in great shape. We are starting the process of looking for a new CEO for FanDuel. We remain focused on maintaining our leadership position in the U.S. market. King, as mentioned in the article here, Adam, uh, kind of hinted that maybe he is looking elsewhere or at least has something burning inside of him. It's been a privilege to lead FanDuel the last four years through what has been an incredibly exciting period for the company. With FanDuel well-positioned for the next chapter's growth and always entrepreneur at heart, now is the time for me to take on new opportunities as the next chapter, as the next step in my career so almost hinting a little bit that maybe he wants to move on try something new in all of this but uh as dustin mentioned we had been talking about i mean listen we talk stonks here on this uh on this podcast disclaimer we are not stock experts do not buy or sell anything based off of anything that we say at all but we talk about stocks a lot here especially these gaming stocks that have been you know absolutely plummeted at the beginning of the pandemic and now in this meteoric rise since then and, uh, you know, FanDuel is one of those companies that has not been a part of that because they had not been listed over here. And so we were wondering, you know, should that we, we heard rumblings that maybe that was going to be the case. And does this th- this has to affect that, right? In fact, Matt Flutter acknowledged that in the press statement that it put out about Matt King leaving. I mean, they were very clear in saying that his departure is going to affect their timing in terms of doing this Uh so Flutter kind of got ahead of it and said, hey, look, we're still thinking about this, but obviously we're not going to do it while we're in the middle of a leadership change. I think what's also not said within that is, y'all, take a look at DraftKings and Penn right now. 
because those stocks, while they had been on huge rises, mm -hmm. uh, they've actually shaved a little bit off their prices. Uh, DraftKings was as low as $42 uh, earlier on Tuesday when we know that that stock had cleared $70 not that long ago. We've seen Penn uh, shave some as well. And of course, both of those companies just had earnings calls recently. So, you know, I think that when FanDuel does this, and I don't think it's an if, I do think it's a when, when FanDuel does this, it'll be coming into a little steadier of a market. And the also unsaid piece is that this whole mess they have going on with this Fox lawsuit and arbitration is a huge factor in uncertainty in the future of Flutter overall. Yeah, Dustin, that's kind of what was my follow up here that Adam just led into is, yeah, they are the market leader. And, you know, we follow the numbers as much as anyone and, and get the market share and things like that. And as in, in pretty much everywhere they are located, there might be some exceptions here and there and might be some some toggle back and forth from month to month in a couple of the markets. But I think by and large, we kind of look at them as the 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 number one DraftKings being a very close number two. Um, but it's not all kind of behind the scenes is not all just, you know, sunshine and rainbows and things like that. There are some things, as you mentioned, the, the, the Nigel thing is still lingering. There's stuff with the Fox bet stuff is still. So th there are things going on here behind the scenes. Yeah. And you're coming into a world, you know, if you take this job, you're coming into a world where everybody's now gunning for you, right? This mm -hmm. is not, you know, you now, FanDuel and DraftKings have had their fun. Uh, everybody is coming for you. <laughs> MGM coming for you. Barstool coming for you. Caesars, as we talked about last week, coming for you with uh, deploying its brand more more liberally with the uh, completing the acquisition of William Hill. So, yeah, it's you know, there's, there's no God given right for FanDuel to be number one. They have leveraged what they've had, you know, and in coming out of out of all this, I wouldn't have handicapped even DraftKings or FanDuel being in either of these positions just based on their on what's going on. But they've they've done a lot of smart moves pre and post pass, but to get to this point, and they are where they are. But it's yeah, you're you're coming into a situation that's much more competitive than it was two to three years ago when you're just opening up new states. Everybody was kind of running around with their chicken like chickens with their heads cut off, and you you took advantage of that because you had the DFS databases that were ready to go. So. Yeah, it's it's interesting, uh, you know, and just put a postscript on it too. I mean, Matt King isn't the most visible person I think ever in mm. in all of this. He's, you know, it's not like he's invisible, but you know, you look at a Jason Robbins who is on TV right. all the time, is much more forward fa folk facing uh, part of the brand. Matt King, to a lesser extent, has been that for Fanduel, and you know, he he started off as the C CFO. Uh, you know, this is you know, he's not a sports betting person, so maybe that part of it makes sense uh, as well in terms of of him moving on. But uh, it, it is interesting, and whoever. You know, it'll be really interesting to see who Fandle will take taps for this job, whether it's somebody in the U.S., somebody right. in Europe with some experience, somebody, somebody internal from Flutter. Uh, I'll be curious to see who they tap for this job. Yeah, it, it, that is that'll be the very interesting kind of follow up to this. Adam will just be, you know, who gets this gig? I mean, it's got to be a super highly coveted gig. Is it going to be someone from the financial world? Is it going to be someone that actually has sports betting slash iGaming slash, you know, casino experiences? You know, where, where do they draw from? Because we are, it is an, an interesting evolving space, interesting evolving world. So I don't know if there necessarily is the cookie cutter perfect candidate for something like this because everything continues to to ever evolve especially when we say the you know the the real long-term end goal here for all this is is actually the i casino part of everything so are you are you wanting someone who's actually more focused on the casino side of things so it will be be very interesting to see who who ends up taking this well before everything shook loose between fox and FanDuel and flutter I do think there was a pretty obvious name, and this is not something that I have any confirmation of. I am wildly speculating and starting rumors here on the LSR podcast. Clay but, Travis. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Doc, Doc Travis, exactly my guy. Kip Levin's right there, folks. Like, Kip Levin has experience with FanDuel. It's not, you know, it's not a brand new thing. But, of course, Kip, who's now running Fox Bet, you know, it's not quite the uh, the same transition it might have been otherwise. It might not be what they were looking for in the first place, but there was at least one name out there who I think made some sense, uh, you know, as sort of a natural fit. But again, that's obviously not going to happen. Um, you, you just made a very good point also that it's the iCasino in the end. And, and if they are going to bring in someone with experience, there are far more people who have important experience when it comes to online casino 
than when it comes to sports betting. Mm-hmm. You you know, and when you look at what that is going to mean for the future, that would probably be the smart way to go. Guys, as always, a uh, really good article over there. Like in Adam did it in the middle of the night. So if there's if there happens to be a typo, just you know, just ignore there's it. He not. did it. Yeah, I mean, he just did it. He there's did it not. in the middle of the night over there. But no. uh, all the quotes from you know from from all the players here in that article as well. If you want to go ahead and read on down that while you're while you're around, go ahead subscribe, rate and review us over there. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google. We really do appreciate that. Help us climb up those charts. More people can find this thing that we're doing here. Uh, Adam, listen, we've seen this a couple of different times. This has been something that um, is not new. We saw it with with we, we saw it with Golden um, we, in, and we saw it with the Golden Nugget. And then now we are seeing kind of some of these other companies. We've talked about the 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 SPAC, you know, or the SPAC and how those have been really, really, really popular so far here in the last few months. And now we have a brand that, listen, I don't know how popular this brand is nationwide i mean i know you and i here we look at it and we think okay that's you know prestige that's like super high end it's super whatever you know with the win brand and and whatnot i don't know where what people on the east coast think they do have the casino in massachusetts and whatnot but i mean i think we think of the win brand as holding some value and we think of it as kind of you know a premier brand and a premier name we shall see i suppose because they're making moves and they think that there is some market share to be had. So Win Interactive will spin off from Win, so sports betting and online casino product for that company is going to get a big cash infusion, uh, upwards of $600 million coming to Win Interactive as it will go public via a SPAC that is led most notably by Vegas Golden Knights owner Bill Foley. Uh, it's not going to give Foley anywhere near a controlling interest, of course, Win will maintain, uh, you know, majority shareholder status in that company, but it's obviously a big, big piece for them to be able to fuel their ambitions of bringing that product far and wide. Uh, they've got eyes on Massachusetts, notably, of course, because they have a property there uh, in Encore. But what it says is that Win is serious about this, and I don't know in terms of brand what it means for them nationally, but I do think there's a very specific customer that Win could be looking at, right? It's a luxury brand. It's very clearly a high-end brand that is targeted at high-end clientele. They've got a couple things that unfortunately are working against them, and it's unfortunate for a number of reasons, of course, personally and then professionally, but the reputation of Steve Wynn took quite a hit over the last few years with the sexual assault allegations that were out there, and so that brand I don't think is nearly as valuable as it once was, but it's still very recognizable, mm-hmm. and there's probably a decent portion of the population that doesn't know about uh, those allegations, right. and so they'll still have brand awareness. Um, there's another interesting question that comes up, though, in that we dealt with Tillman Fertitta, the owner of the Rockets in New Jersey, and the fact that Regulators there at one point, uh, the law was almost being set up to where Golden Nugget couldn't take any NBA bets, period. Uh, Thankfully, there was some sanity and some lobbying that got involved there. Now it's just Rockets bets that can't go on the board at Nugget, New Jersey, same way it is here in Nevada. But there's probably a conversation that's going to have to be had at some point about Wynn's ability to take uh, Golden Knights and uh, NHL bets, given Foley's ownership stake in that SPAC. Uh, win bet currently live in six states uh, new jersey colorado virginia indiana tennessee and michigan notably absent is nevada because we don't have what they have they have a completely different product than we have so it's uh yeah it's not even called win bet here actually it's just no. called win sports yeah it's it's not a completely different product with all of that um dustin when you take a look at this i mean the i, I guess a lot of people might start wondering and say well, what is the benefit of spinning off these, uh, you know, into these other into these other entities, right? Like, why isn't just the the sports betting and the iGaming gaming all just under the win banner? Why? What's the what is the big deal about having to go and and spin these things off? And so, is there is there an obvious answer as to why these companies are creating these additional companies that that, that don't really you know, necessarily include the the main part of the business? 
I mean, one is an infusion of cash. That was part of this one, right? You know, you don't, you don't, you don't just, if you go do this, you get a pile of cash to go Mm -hmm. do things with, uh, you know, uh, for the aforementioned reasons, Wynn has to to spend a lot of that cash if it wants to be a player uh, in the short term to compete with, you know, the the brand deficit, all of the, everything. They're they're obviously going aggressively in the States. The fact that, you know, not too not too long ago, we were, you would have been talking about Wynn and this, it was been the speculative thing and now they're in all those States, right? So that's, that's part of it. Um, I mean, yeah, you're also getting the chain, you know, rolling that up. You don't get the true value out of out of the land based casino versus the online casino. Um, that's another part of it. Um, and yeah, you look at all these other others, others that have done it. You're saying, oh, well, maybe we should do this. Yeah. Although, like Adam alluded to, like it, it's a little too early to call the SPAC and the, the, uh, the public's adoration of online gambling stocks to be over. But Man, it's been a brutal run with with uh, with everybody shaving. You know, gold nugget uh, online gambling, online gaming. Another one where you know casino and sports uh, outside of Nevada as well. Even though the brand is is technically is usually thought of as a Nevada brand, like that stock has shed a lot of value even since you know with with good tailwinds of like a Michigan launch and things going well. So uh, you know uh, you don't know if people will be you know rethinking the strategy moving forward because based on current market results there's probably there's still reasons to do it but you know i think access to cash and having you know having a you know an online only brand that's separate from the land-based gambling brand certainly makes sense so we can't uh we can't get past a podcast without talking something about DraftKings. seems that they always have something going on and then this week is is no exception so we take a look at social betting and DraftKings, I think whenever we look at this company and, and Dustin, I mean, you know, look again, they have kind of, they are trying to do the whole in, in encapsulate all things gambling, right? I mean, they don't have a poker arm as it is right now. Will that change? I guess we'll see. But, you know, with the DFS side of things, they have the, they have just the free to play games that they do as well. Now they have, they have the sports betting side. So now here we go into the social betting realm. What is DraftKings doing within that? Yeah, as part of DraftKings Q1 call, they they rolled out what they are talking about as a as adding a, a social component to their to their product. Uh, here's what CEO Jason Robbins said. I'll just read his words for you. For you, the product is particularly unique because it amplifies our ability to create an interconnected ecosystem across our consumer products. Features like universal profiles, friends list, commenting, and loyalty rewards will allow DraftKings to connect users across products. Uh, this has been, uh, you know, not maybe not the holy grail, but you know, people continue to think that there is a lot of value in in you know creating stickiness out of having a social component where friends can talk to friends or you talk to other people about your bets or share your bets um you know have friends on your on the app you know uh, it's 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 never really proven to work as a great feature to to generate this you know this engagement with the brand now DraftKings you know maybe doing something a little different really integrating into this product uh, there's lots of people right now trying to do startups around social betting as well in terms of doing that sharing and, and all of this so you know uh, it's it's a thing DraftKings pr- pushing growth pushing innovation in the space so you know th- that's part of that narrative whether it works we're, we'll be sitting here I'm sure talking about it uh, in 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 the, in the coming years because if they, if it becomes something then you have something but you know uh, I think that to date this has not proved to be some ma- amazing uh, some magic bullet in the UK for mm-hmm. creating stickiness uh, and that's that's kind of the benchmark is that we haven't seen this really work but you know DraftKings thinks it has a different take on this and is going to uh, plow ahead and see if it uh, can do what it says it's going to do in terms of uh, creating retaining uh, betters a little bit better than anyone else is doing right now yeah adam i i look at something like this and i wonder if it's one of those deals where they look and say okay this might not be as dustin kind of said it might not be like a magic bullet by any stretch of the imagination but you know eventually and i think maybe this is a a look at the long term right i mean eventually for us that we will have to switch from acquisition to retention right i mean there's going everything's all about acquisition right now for sure as they move into these other states as new markets open up as these markets continue to mature and new customers still continue to keep coming on over and over and over again we're still all about acquisition at this point but there will come a day when it will be more about retention and so and maybe even reactivation from that point standpoint as well and so i'm wondering if this is just a hey, let's try and get out in front of this a little bit. Let's see if this works. Maybe we can tweak it over the next couple of years and to where when we really need something like this three, four, or five years down the road, we at least have something working in our favor as opposed to, again, just 
unloading a boatload of cash to try to get people to come back in and and bet again or or get them going again. It's not an unreasonable idea, Matt, mm-hmm. to say that you're looking at something that is not going to be as valuable to you now as it would be later. I think the question that you and I and Dustin would ask as folks who have been watching this industry for a while is who's asking for this, right? I I don't see where the demand is right now for this product because as Dustin mentioned, it has been a feature that really has not proven all that popular because people tend to stick to the channels they're already communicating through, right? Like this, Mm -hmm. we know that there is for better and often for much, much worse, a sports betting Twitter uh, out there that (laughs) is interactive with each other. Um, You know, you you text your own friends, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe there's something to be said there for developing community that you didn't have otherwise, right? Like it's entirely possible. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do wonder at this point though, I hope for DraftKings' sake that they have yeah. enough resources in terms of money, in terms of people, in terms of tech to be dedicating to this right now in a phase where everyone else is just trying to keep up in the acquisition, right? I mean, yeah. Maybe it speaks to the fact that they have enough resources that they can focus a little bit more on something that is forward-looking like this that no one else has been able to do successfully and say, yeah, we, we should be able to make this work long-term. Maybe it's also something that to their investors who are looking at the last couple earnings reports and saying, still not seeing profitability here, that they can point to and say, well, look, you know, we're, we're, we're doing more to try to keep mm-hmm. people around. And these people that we've brought in are going to have a better long term, I should say, lifetime value because we're going to be able to not only keep them in sports betting, but we're going to be able to sell them across to casino and be able to get more money out of them. And this is what we're doing to try to keep them there and bring them into the other products. That makes a ton of sense if that's the way they're going. Yeah. Uh, it's just right now, I'm not sure who wants this. Yeah, I uh, the, when I read this story, I think the first thing, the, I mean, actually the very first thought that came to my mind was just, this is obviously not meant for me. Like, I think this is meant for, <laughs> I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think for yeah. people, maybe not even just a generation younger than us, but maybe even like, you know, even, even the generation before that, right? I think that, you know, I, we all use, you know, we, we use so- social media, we use, we use Twitter for, for work purposes and we use, you know, the various things like that. But I don't think, you know, we use it near as much as the people who are even 10 years younger than us and certainly not the people who are 15 or 20 years younger than us who share every single thing that they possibly do on the Internet and want everyone to know what they're doing at all times. And so maybe that extends over even into sports betting or DFS and things like that. Maybe you make a bet you want everyone to know and you want to tell everyone real quick or you want to bet and you do all. I, I, I don't know. I think, again, it's maybe not targeted at my demographic, but maybe at a demographic, you know, a little bit younger than me. Fair enough. Fair? It, it, yeah. Fair. It, it absolutely makes sense. Although if you're saying two generations younger, I mean, <laughs> we're, we're young guys. That generation hasn't even been born yet. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> two generations younger. Sports betting uh, generations. Like, you oh, know, like, oh, like oh. Okay, like, yeah. Sports betting generations yes. are like four or five years. That's fine. Yes, I can live with yes, that. Yes. Yeah, like sports betting generations here whenever we go through that. Uh, all right, Adam, let's, uh, let's talk here about something that is good news and then turns instantly into bad news. You must be talking about Illinois, Matt, uh, yeah, where yeah. we have a fantastic revenue report showing more than $600 million in handle in March uh, as Illinois ascends to the top two in the U.S. in terms of sports betting handle for the month. And then it gets Pritzkerd. You just got Pritzkerd, Illinois. You have no more remote registration because the governor who had suspended the ill-conceived 18-month in-person registration requirement that was put into Illinois' sports betting law, he suspended it for months during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then, I don't know if he wished COVID away or (laughs) if he individually is out there sanitizing casinos, but uh, he ended the suspension of that requirement, meaning that This will be the last month that we have a revenue report based on growth where people could sign up for a sports betting account in Illinois remotely and start that account remotely. We are now back to you have to go to the casino in order to sign up for an account. Now, it doesn't mean all that the money all the money is going to go away. You obviously have had months and months of acquisition here where you've been able to get a certain amount of customers. But you just talked about it, Matt. Uh, how about some retention, right? Mm-hmm. Because we're going to get an early look at how do you retain those customers and keep them betting when, you know, you, you have no way of growth, right? Like you don't have 
the ability to get new customers in with promotions, you're going to be either bonusing the people who are there or finding other ways to activate them. So, Dustin, here's the thing about this. Whenever we look and, you know, I think the key date here would mean unless he, you know, changes his mind or unless there's some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of change in what's going on there, it's January where they would actually be able to remote sign up again, which means you miss basically the entire football season, which, as we know, is where you sign up the, the, the vast majority of your customers. And so this is such a key date here. I think it would be less we, – we wouldn't be making such a big deal out of it. It was like, oh, okay, but it expires in September or even October where you still get a bulk of the season. You can still get a lot of people to sign up. You can still whatever. But – January means you're basically missing the entire football season here, which is so incredibly prime for all of these online sports books to sign up people. So it is it is actually a pretty massive, massive thing that's going on here and super massive for a book like DraftKings, whose physical location is actually way outside of Chicago. So it's not even like it's one of those easy drives to go sign up. So even if, if somebody does want an account that they can go do that. So it's a. Uh, I don't know if uh, if if smart if, if smarts will just actually win out here, or if this is actually going to be you know taking us until January of 2022 before people can get back to doing what they were doing anyway already successfully. Yeah, I'll take the under on smarts. Uh, I, I don't think that's going to happen. So, oh yeah, we're going to be stuck with this in Illinois for a while, and we don't really need another data point, but we're going to get the data point anyway because yeah. we saw, you know, we saw in, you know, we have Illinois where in-person registration goes away for a little while, numbers skyrocket. I mean, part of that was football season, but mm -hmm. we 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 have that. We have the same in Iowa, where remote registration remote registra registration started at the end of the year. Obviously, sports betting handle goes up because it's easier for people to sign up. We're going to see, you know, it's not going to be real obvious here in the summer months when sports are slower, but we're going to see Illinois kind of, I, I would think, lag off in terms of growth uh, around football season because of this dynamic. So we'll have another data point of this is just wrongheaded policy. Please stop doing this, lawmakers. I'm a broken record, but <laughs> if any of you are listening to this, please stop right. stop doing this. It's also bad for you know new and operators who aren't yet live, and uh, Barstool is the one that probably is going to be hurt the most by this. They had basically three weeks of acquisition where they could sign people up remotely. Mm -hmm. And now the spigot's turned off. You have to, you know, you'd have to now go in person just like everybody else to, to, to sign up for the app. So, you know, Barstool is going to be at a pretty big deficit right now. They're just, uh, they're around the size of points bet in terms of, of handle and, and revenue. So well behind the, the three market leaders. So they're not, they're not going to be able to cut into that in any meaningful way without being able to acquire customers easily. So those are the data points we have for Illinois. And yeah, I I, mean, I, don't, I just I just don't see it changing. There's not going to be any reason for it to change uh, yeah. at this point. This is it is what it is, and yeah, we just we just hope that we stop seeing this policy in, in states around the country. And, and Adam, just to, to, yeah, yeah, one thing to, oh, uh, to add to that, Matt, before you uh, to, before you continue, one yeah. thing to add to that, Dustin mentioned Barstool, BetMGM still in the licensing process, and mm -hmm. so you know here we are with Rivers again getting its way. Where, I mean, let's just be honest about this. It's Rivers is the reason that we have this in the that, law. They are that's very what I was powerful doing. politically. Yeah, that, that's where I was going with this. Is like if, if the people yeah. didn't know just the backstory real quick, it's yeah. like it was supposed to give an advantage to the land-based casino that was, that was locally uh, operating there. But once that had gone away, it, 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 the advantage was, was, was over with anyway. So like this whole thing just, it, it didn't make any sense in the first place, but now it really, really, really makes no sense. No, we are trying to both at the same time, and imagine how hard this is, shove a cat back into a bag, a genie back <laughs> into a bottle, and toothpaste back into a tube all at the same time. And I don't have enough hands for that, nor do most of the sports <laughs> books in Illinois. So, yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense. Look, it's the law, and if Pritzker doesn't want to renew the executive order, then he's got pretty good cover to not do it. Hey, it's the law, and I don't think it's necessary anymore, but it's certainly going to hurt Illinois. And as Dustin mentioned, Barstool, and as I mentioned, BetMGM. All right, Dustin, we look when Tennessee passed sports betting, we were like, OK, you know, listen, this is pretty cool. It'll be an all you know, it'll be an all online thing. There's no physical casinos in Tennessee as it is. They had a pretty cool licensing process. All that, all, you know, we're going to see a bunch of competition there. There should be good deals for the betters there, all that. Then things started to get a little weird and people started doing some nefarious things and all that. And it's like, so here we are with Tennessee and I'm not going to say it's a mess, but like it's kind of a mess. 
Oh, it's a mess. I think that's pretty fair. I don't think I don't I don't think anybody would really argue with you on on, yeah. on the uh, calling it a mess. So what's going on there is uh, they're trying to move away the regulatory duties away from the Tennessee Education Lottery Board and to a council that was uh, put up set up by the law specifically to deal with sports betting. Uh, and you know the, this comes a lot out of the one regulatory mess that we have, which is action 24 Mm seven in the state where, uh, they have, you know, they're the, the, the operator is obviously doing things that were uh, not up to snuff, uh, you know, not following anti-money laundering protocols, uh, lots of stuff and not do it, not, not following any kind of regulations from, from where we sit. And so, you know, the, the, there's been a mess around that. They got uh, suspended briefly, you know, had to be, because of a, of a court order had to be put back into action, even though they really shouldn't have been. And so the, the, the laws, they're trying to clear this up and moving forward with, a, there's a bill in Tennessee where they're trying to move this to this council, but they, even that's a mess because this council is, that, that has, uh, that they're trying to give this to, doesn't really have any sports betting expertise mm-hmm. on it. It's, it's a bunch of people who do not. So, um, you know, taking it off of the, the, the lottery board as, as regulator here does make a lot of sense, but, you know, we're maybe creating more of a mess by not having the right people on this. You know, this 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 was the problem with Tennessee as a state that didn't have any kind of real uh, gambling know how before this, other than the lottery, is that we're we're we got we have a law that's not that's not been implemented in the best way. Where you know we have an open market, but for some reason, not everybody in the in the entire world is in Tennessee right now. So. It's all very strange, you know. It's you know, not not you know the, the states that have game gaming uh, existing gaming history ha- haven't been perfect either. But to that extent, it's been you know that part's been the rollout of this has not been good in Tennessee, and it's it's certainly disappointing to see because otherwise, yes, we have a, an open competitive market that should be kind of a good it should have been a good market for everyone. And uh, you know, just from the regulatory side, it's been quite a mess and has has been a bit of a black eye, I think, for sports betting in the U.S. Let's get Adam. down to brass tacks on this real quick, yeah. uh, Matt. Just to just, I'm going to get straight down to the brass tacks yeah. on this. The lottery director in Tennessee didn't and doesn't want sports betting. Period. Mm-hmm. She wants to run lottery. She does not want anything to do with sports betting. She's doing everything she can to get rid of sports betting. It's a game she doesn't understand. It's a game that she tried to stick a 10% minimum hold requirement on to make it more like a lottery product. And so this is what happens when you have government regulators who don't know how to run something. Mm -hmm. Very simply, they don't know what the hell they're doing. And they're admitting it openly. They are openly admitting and saying, we don't know this, we don't get this, and we don't want to do it. And we don't care if it gets put into the hands of a board that doesn't know jack squat about the gaming industry as long as we don't have to do it anymore. And they showed it, by the way, they completely jacked the Action 24-7 situation by going against their own rules, ending up in court, and then having a judge say to them, no, no, you screwed this up. You screwed it up so badly you can't go back and do it again. This is what you get when you have people who are not competent running an industry. And, and this is actually for, for both of y'all here. I mean, so when we kind of look at this, and we won't have this problem maybe a, in a decade from now, but... We're three years removed from the repeal of PASPA. And what really happened here is this all kind of snowballed, I think, way faster than all of us thought. All these states started passing, I think, faster than all of us thought. And there weren't really that many people out there who had any expertise in any of this stuff. Because you could say, like, oh, well, you could go to Vegas. They've had sports betting for X number of years. But, Adam, you and I both know, one— you still can't bet on a computer here. The mobile function, like the 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 focus on mobile here, has been lacking at best, and cert- only recently has it even been uh, attention been given to it because of the success that's been happening in the rest of the country. And so, like going and finding people with real expertise on how to run this stuff and come in and do it efficiently and do it properly. There probably just weren't that many people unless you went went and go like start plucking people from overseas. But we have also found out with that that, you know, it's a different customer overseas than it is here. It's a different way they run things over there than it is over here. And so we're probably just at a very big dearth of talent more than anything else of people who can who can successfully run this stuff. Well, let's let's pull the veil back here. Let's let's be honest about this because we try to tell people exactly how it is on this podcast. Where has the talent been for the last 25 years? It's been in Costa Rica. It's been in Curacao. It's been in the offshore market. There is talent. The talent is in the offshore market. And God bless and good luck trying to get them licensed 
over here mm. in the U.S. market. You've gone and been doing something that is a shady, at best, illegal, likely op operation in the U.S. for the last 20 odd years, which I'll be sympathetic to some degree. When PASPA came around, if, if you weren't going to get a job in Vegas, where were we going to get a job? Right. Mm -hmm. And if some company from overseas like uh, for, and it wasn't Europe or the UK, if someone from Costa Rica came to you with a great job offer to run a sports book, you might just take it if you weren't going to have that job anywhere else. So yeah. now when you come back into the industry and you say, well, how do you get people uh, to run these things? You're right. There is a dearth of talent because a lot of it had to go to places that can't get licensed now. Yeah. And, and Dustin, I mean, we kind of saw this. And, you know, we kind of saw this through the years as well. I mean, listen, during the poker boom, all these new online sites popped up. There were people who didn't know what they were doing. The sites get run, you know, the sites immediately go out of business. We see DFS companies pop up all over the place. These people don't know what they're doing. They go out of, they go out of business as well. And, and we're not seeing that necessarily in the, in the sports betting side. But it just I think the principle is still the same, that it's like there aren't a lot of people who have a lot of experience in running this stuff successfully and i think we're seeing it play out across the whole company country here like we this might not have this problem a decade from now when you know other when all these states have had some people in there for a while they start to understand what's going on they start to understand how to run things the customers what uh, how, how to make things run more efficiently but i i'm i don't think it's crazy to think that right now we just probably just don't have a lot of those people yeah, and again, you, you you at least start with gambling. You, know, you understand gambling. Like the, yeah. we had this perfect storm in Tennessee of a regulator doesn't know what it's doing <laughs> and an operator doesn't know what it's doing. Right. That's not going to end up well for anyone. I think we could have all seen that coming. Mm -hmm. You know, whether uh, the exact scenario that we saw play out, I don't know if we saw that coming, but this this was a mess waiting to happen before anything started. So, yeah, I agree. You know, I don't I don't know what the solution is. You know, and again, some states have done better than others with with, with you know on the regulatory front and dealing with this, but. You know, and, and this is part of why, you know, why the European companies are seeing they already have this, you know, uh, this regulatory uh, ro uh, roadmap. They already know what they're doing. They deal with regulation in lots of jurisdictions, you know, porting that over to dealing with a state by state basis is, is not as hard. But, um, yeah, here in the U.S., you know, it's again, we're, they're, you know, we're, there's there is there is this it is a larger problem. And I don't I don't I don't know how we solve it. But like because yeah. like Adam says, you can't just, uh, you know, other than the, the sports betting dying platform, which is still sitting or the sports betting uh I'm losing the words here. The the um, what am I trying to say, Adam? Which you which operator? About five dimes. Five dimes. I'm yeah. not. Yeah, five dimes. Mm -hmm. Wrong dime uh, <laughs> in, in my brain. Uh, five dimes. Like other than that, there's not been any kind of washing of the offshore market. And uh, I, I, you know, I don't, honestly don't. I don't know if I hope that happens or not. But we, sh you know, you sh if you're going to be, you know, getting talent from offshore, or, or you should be looking carefully at what they've done, mm -hmm. to what capacity, how if you know what if they were knowingly operating illegally. There's, but you can't just uh, you can't just snap your fingers and say, up, oh, you know, everything's all forgiven. You guys get to come and and work in the regular regulated market all right adam let's uh let's take this thing home with some state updates as we always do and i'm sure my friends listening in my home state will have an update from you here as well for once i can say something good about louisiana <laughs> as opposed to the dfs mess where you know you voted for it in 2018 you're still sitting there tapping your watch like mm. come on so no the uh sports betting which passed in 55 of 64 parishes in november of 2020 looks to be moving along at a pretty good pace here the house passed the tax bill to enable sports betting in louisiana and now we are over on the Senate side working on regulation bill. Look, these are just enabling bills. It's already been approved by voters. Uh, but of course, we saw that with DFS, it's yeah. not always that simple uh, right. to just pass the bills and get it done because that was passed years ago. But uh, Stefanski, the rep who's been in charge of things down there with the tax bill, told our Matt Waters, like, hey, people didn't really necessarily understand what fantasy sports was at the government level. We know what sports betting is. It's going to be easier to educate people and get this done. So uh, entirely possible that you have some form of sports betting by NFL season this year, realistically, by the end of NFL season for sure. But it's not impossible that something gets done by the beginning of the NFL season. So good news there in Louisiana. Ohio, uh, interestingly, Dustin and I talked about the weird Ohio bill that came out last week and the rep in charge of things there, I should say the uh, senator in charge of things there, uh, came back to us and said, well, you know, we've already gotten some feedback uh, and there's some things we're working on in this bill. So they didn't get great uh, response to their initial bill, which was going to make it very difficult for professional sports teams and casinos to get in on sports betting. And I think that 
whether it's lobbyists or some powerful people came in and said, are you sure that's how you meant to write this bill? So there's a hearing actually going on now today uh, on that bill in Ohio. We're still likely to get something done in Ohio. It's just going to take a little bit of time for things to get sorted out. Of course, we're already two years into that bill. So who knows? Florida next week is really uh, where we need to pay attention in Florida. The special session that is going to happen at the legislature that will involve the compact that Governor DeSantis and the Seminole Tribe agreed to that would facilitate sports betting, among other changes to gambling in Florida, will be uh, part of that special session. So we're, we're eyeing next week in Florida. Process is ongoing in Arizona, in New York. Nothing really to update you on there as those states get ready to bring things around. Guys, as always, we have, I mean, just an incredible amount of written stuff. I mean, we didn't even get to everything that is getting up over there on the site at Legal Sports Report, which is incredibly awesome. Adam and his team just really cranking out all the goods. Of course, you can also get updated on uh, on all the things that have happened over the last year, if you haven't been able to follow everything, there's a handy dandy little map you can click on. There's all kinds of things like that. If you want to know what's been going on in all these states and how things have progressed and, and how they got there, because this is uh, really, really uh, confusing stuff if you don't follow it day in and day out. And so uh, fortunately, Adam and the crew do. And uh, there's a lot of way, a lot of resources over there for you to be able to catch up on all the stuff that's going down as well i do want you to follow them on the twitter machine at adam candy to ease no why at dustin galker and again if you really despise yourself you can follow me at matt no M2. no matt we I, I wanted to find out if you got a big bump in followers last week because i very specifically at the end of the podcast said people who love themselves need to follow matt brown <laughs> oh that's so nice you know who did follow me the southern nevada water authority followed me today so uh there's that they obviously are listening to the podcast so wow big yeah. big brothers uh on yeah. you about the lawn watch oh, out oh, oh yeah yeah after th- it, it, it's i don't think it's a coincidence got me a couple warnings so i'm just kind of wondering <laughs> like, like what what are, what's going on here like uh my newest twitter follower and all this but uh guys honestly uh head over to legal sports report take in all the written work over there it is a great Great, great, great job by Adam and the team. For Dustin, for Adam, I'm Matt. Talk to you guys next week.